I grew up in Eureka, um, Northern California, and um, it's a, you know, it, it was a logging town when I was growing up. Uh, it's changed now. The logging industry is mostly gone. Um, um, not a not a rich place at all, but uh, we were very lucky. We had um, good musical education in our high school, and uh, Humboldt State University that I was going to had a really good music library and a couple of great instructors. And I placed well on my exams, so they gave me a very long leash to do independent study. Um, so I had all those resources available. Um, so that was sort of going along with my teenage angst years that were very extreme. Um, somehow putting those things together made... Uh, when I migrated to, to San Francisco, it was very, uh, very much a relief on a bunch of different levels. We were sort of prepared. My, my friends and I that were musicians were, were prepared to receive uh, the extra influx of information that we could get here, but we were also sort of happy to not be um, getting our asses kicked or under threat of bodily injury for, you know, for the pursuits that we liked to engage in. I, I listened to a lot of like Slayer kind of death metal stuff, um, depending on which, you know, era of which part of the teenage years you're talking about. I guess the formative years were in this kind of extreme metal. But it was at the same time as listening to, my dad would be, you know, playing Poulenc records in the next room and uh, Stravinsky, that's how I, how I came to know Stravinsky's music. It appealed to the teenage angst, certain parts of that, of course, do. So then, by the time I get to the, the music library, I, you know, I can investigate the scores, just try to understand what's going on uh, with, with that tradition of music while still sort of having this very aggressive, angsty element going on. Uh, I guess it was, yeah, in the death metal band, 1984, I think would be, maybe 83. The first thing I actually wrote were guitar, classical guitar duets. I think it was 14 or 15, and um, and then that was kind of simultaneous with the with the death metal music. <laughs> I think it was actually the Poulenc Organ Concerto that did it for me, and it was when my dad would fly into a rage, you know, and he put on the Organ Concerto, that first sort of minor major seven chord, that just does something. Like, even though it was probably me who made my dad angry, I related to his expression of that anger so much through that, that chord, which is a requiem. I think it was, it was a requiem for Paul Hindemith. I think it was. But whatever it is, it's, it wasn't, you know, it's more than just angst, it's sorrow, and it's, it's so powerful. I think, I think that's what did it for me. I, I, I guess in the upbringing, yeah, it's, it's both life experience that is completely out of synchronization with a sort of, um, you know, mu musically educated background or perspective that I have. It's basically like a kid who's, you know, trying to focus on these more refined things, but coming home with like black and blue marks from getting beat up by rednecks. You know, like that mixture, I would say, is the most formative thing in my life, two, two things that are completely out of sync with each other. My, my whole life has always had things that are completely the opposite going on simultaneously. Yes, and in fact, well, not the first time I ever heard it, but the first time I ever paid attention um, was surely Cronus uh, Black Angels, for sure. I mean, that, I think I heard that when I was 19, so that fit right into the you know, that, that moment of angst I was referring to earlier. That, I went out and bought the score, and uh, I still have it, and that completely changed my idea of what's possible with music. I didn't really think about the string quartet so much, you know, at that point, but it was, you know, another medium where this kind of power and, and expression can be captured. We've been talking about my teenage years, but most of the work I've done since then has been, um, let's say, very aware of different 
musical traditions from around the world. And instead of deconstructing tonality or subjecting it to, um, you know, microtonal dissonances and this kind of thing, I've somehow rebounded off of those angst years and become more obsessive about creating tonality, diatonic tonality, and what consonants means when you go outside of the 12-tone equal temperament system. So that's taken me back to, you know, pre-modern Western music, but also um, very much into music from the Middle East. Um, studied a, a bit without really trying to learn repertoire or borrow from traditions directly, but learning the music theory behind like Adastka systems and Makam. So I've had to bend my instruments and my ensembles around frettings that are, you know, equal temperament. You have to come up with solutions to that. And, you know, so I, I think that that, having been somewhat successful in doing that, um, I think maybe, maybe the quartet or David noticed that. And after all, here we are, string quartet, it's tetrachords, four strings, like the human voice, there's no fretting. So it's an ensemble that can harmonize those things very gracefully, unlike a guitar or, a, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping that that's why they asked me, because that's what I tried to do for them. Well, surely, yeah, I mentioned the Stravinsky Poulenc uh, recently. Actually, because of the quartet, I went back and was listening to a lot of Ravel and trying to, trying to understand orchestration. It's the best place to go, and, you know, you learn how far away you are by doing that. Um, and as far as composers, I mean, I don't, it's weird because there's a lot of the music that I listen to is not exactly, you know, high art either. Uh, Rahul Dev Berman, R.D. Berman, uh, in the 90s, when I was here in San Francisco, um, there was an import store on Mission Street, which is gone now, but they had cheap tapes from, you know, Bollywood films. And it really, at that point, it was, for me, it was a matter of economics. Like, you could buy these cassette tapes for 99 cents. And if, you know, I could go up to, like, a hipster record store and spend 15 bucks and be disappointed, or I could buy a stack of 15 Bollywood soundtracks, and three of them are going to be great, and one of them is going to be magically great. And I started to notice after a time that R.D. Berman's name was there most of the time. So I started obsessively collecting and listening to R.D. Berman scores. That had a huge impact on how I approach recording, actually, even more than um, compositions, more than instrumentation. He was a genius of, of mixing Western and Eastern instruments without having a, a clash, quite the opposite you know, having some magical collision happen out of it. That had a huge, huge impact on me. I wanted to, to return to plain chant and, and medieval dance and have that be sort of the, um, the basis of what then is the, the second movement, which is really far afield. But both of them, both of those movements being bookending on a... Uh, a kind of an early music feeling um, helps the also sort of ancient nature of the second movement, I think, um, or at least the, the feeling of it is, has this ancient gravity to it. Um, so for the quartet, I was, I'm just trying to establish, it's not really necessarily modernism that we're dealing with here. We're dealing with returning to, to four note scales or tetrachords being the basis of a, of, a, of a compelling set of things that can start going off into a hundred billion directions. Terrifying number of things that you can do, you know, sort of mathematically or geometrically with, with four notes. I tried to really rein it in and keep it simple because it can get really crazy. And frankly, taking it to the ensemble, it was way too crazy. And I realized, like, you know, how much room and on the ensemble itself, that's what's going to make it harmonically right. If I p put these different sort of intonation systems into it, there's no guarantee anything will be in tune unless the ensemble knows how to be in tune with themselves and with each other. So for me, that was a, actually a wonderful learning experience. Like, okay, you can put those things in there, but it's the ensemble that harmonizes it in the end. What we ended up with, I think, was, was perfect. It was exactly what I was going for. It took me a long time 
to get there, but it, it came together. I get, it, it, it usually has nothing to do really with music. I get obsessive about something. And in this case, it's, um, it was the, well, the theme of spiritual androgyny that um, was explored in a Balzac novel, Serafita, where you have a female um, character who, who sees this angelic being as a male, and the male sees it as a female. And the priest probably sees a little bit more deeply what's actually happening. So the confusion of sort of earthly love or earthly longing with the, the sort of heavenly being and vice versa, the fascination of the heavenly with the earthy. I think all of those things are so powerful, um, you know, ready to be brought into a musical context. So that I started getting obsessive about it and weaving together all these texts. I went really nuts on it, ended up reining it back into the, some fundamentals and... Uh, as soon as I, you know, if I'm thinking about that while I'm writing, it just sort of naturally happens. I, I noticed after I had written the first movement, you know, oh my God, this thing is descending. It's coming down by fourth and fifth, you know, as if a, a, an angel is coming down from heaven, which I didn't, you know, I didn't sit there and go, I'm going to make this descending. It, it, I think that those things just kind of happen when you're, when you're in the right frame of mind to, to write music. I was afraid because when they first asked me, I was like, you know, what am I going to do? I don't know how to write for a string quartet. But then the musical ideas just started coming because of the obsession about this book. It helped get me off of the intimidation factor. You know, then, then the musical ideas just started snowballing. It's easy to think that, that new is always the most exciting ter territory or terrain. And... Um, I think ancient music and the fact that the, the string quartet, the instruments of the string quartet are very ancient and hold a lot of power, a lot of soul through, you know, not just their musical history, but their presence. I think it's good to keep in mind how, uh, how much possibility, maybe we, we, you know, it went off on uh, Haydn. And before that, maybe there's somewhere else it can go. Instead of thinking, well, we're on the Haydn tangent, and now we are doing a bunch of other things and trying to make it interesting, you can also go back and go, there are other interpretations of consonants. There are other ways to think in terms of tonality. Rather than thinking we have to dis deconstruct tonality and start over, or, you know. And there are certainly other musical traditions out there that, that uh, support that, and the instruments are, are adaptable to that, which is great. It's one of the great things about the string quartet. It has no frets, no keys. You know, it's the closest thing to the human voice. So a harmonization outside of the 12-tone uh, equal temperament system is very, very, um, it's just begging for it. So I hope, I hope young people will ex explore that more and more. I did a lot of touring with my band Secret Chiefs in the last 10 years, probably too much. Uh, it kind of took me away from composing and recording, playing all of that, those live shows. Um, but it's been really obsessively just that, just touring and, you know, playing, recording, composing. I record, I mean, every day of my life, I'm in the studio, probably eight hours minimum. It's very obsessive. Luckily, my wife is, uh, is there you know, actually taking care of things, and we, we are actually are able to have a bit of a life. If it wasn't for her, I probably would not would have zero life at all, just be in the studio the whole time. I have so many different sort of uh, pots on the, on the stove, uh, you know, albums. Between recording albums and recording uh, sort of singles, with The Secret Chiefs, there, I, I do have sort of this death metal side. I have this... Um, kind of neo-Pythagorean electro-folk thing. Uh, there's a pipe organ-based group or pipe organ-based idea. We do some, a uh, lot of 19th, late 19th century French pipe organ music and also um, like fairground kind of uh, mechanical piano roll stuff. Um, so 
those are just three of seven main things that I work on. That keeps me very busy because all of that is very challenging. Because it's all completely different, it sounds completely different, and has completely different demands, different instrumentation, different musicians. It's a full schedule just organizing, you know, uh, one of those things to come out in a timely manner, much less six or seven of them. I'm constantly, constantly working. It's ridiculous. If you look in the notes, uh, you know, like the text notes that I wrote for it, um, yeah, digest. If you digest those things, but then really defer to your ensemble dynamics, especially when it comes to the things that are not in standard equal temperament tuning, the point is not to make, you know, a weird note or an off-color note. The, the point is to, to have this, you know, beautiful resonance speak but the, really only the ensemble can can do that so when there's a question about it work it out you know think about what sounds right or what sounds good to you don't get too obsessive about like is this exactly a third tone it's more about you know whether those fourths line up trust the fourths and fifths let the thirds be the interesting uh, mysterious note that is right for your ear because there's no agreement on that anywhere in the world <laughs> Believe me.